So these are my favorite restaurants, just under the uh, JL train. And it's called Guard Shita. Guard, I don't know where it comes from. Tradition it's called Guard Shita restaurant. And yeah, so I often come to these restaurants for lunch, for a quick lunch because uh, these have really quality food, uh, you know, not so expensive. So it's really nice to be living in Tokyo this way. Uh, this is a izakaya place, and this is a coffee shop, and this is a Nagasaki Champo place. It's a special kind of ramen noodles. I come to this place quite often, and this is my all-time favorite, Kenya. It's really wonderful, Kenya. They specialize on tendon. So we started with uh, some looks at the Japanese food, which is always excellent. But today I will probably talk about Japanese politics, which is not so excellent. Well, uh, one of the enigmas in Japanese politics is that uh, there are so not so many changes of government. The LDP, the Democratic Party, has been in power for most of the time, except for a few years breaks um, each uh, in the time that has passed since 1955. It's sometimes uh, called Gojugo Nentaisei, or 1995, sorry, 1955 system, and the Japanese politics has never broken off from that curse or a blessing or whatever, depending on your position. But, oh, by the way, this is Tokyo Station and the people running back to their home because this is uh, going back home time. It's a rush hour. Um, yeah, so, you know, Japanese politics is in a way really stable. Um, the LDP has not lost in any uh, general elections except for a few uh, anomalies. And so, you know, there's no such a dynamic process in Japanese politics and many people would wonder why, especially if, uh, in the viewpoint of those who have come across, uh, come from other countries where change of government is more frequent and, uh, you know, normal. <laughs> By the way, this is the Tokyo Olympics countdown clock again, and let's see. 239 days to go if the Olympics uh, goes forward. Anyway, uh, one of the reasons why the LDP, the Democratic Party, has held power for so many years is, you know, is, can be, you know, found in the general mindset of the Japanese people. You know, the Japanese people love to see that they are in the majority. There is this wonderful Japanese word, futsu, which means normal, and, <laughs> you know, if, uh, well, the general feeling is that, although I don't uh, subscribe to that uh, particular political philosophy, but, you know, there's this general feeling that if you're a normal person, you'd naturally vote for the Liberal Democratic Party, and other crooks or <laughs> fringe people, they might vote for other uh, parties, but that is only a really tiny fraction of uh, the population. So that, I think, has been the general atmosphere in uh, Japan. And most amazingly, uh, in other countries, the younger generations, the you know, 20s and teens, and they, they tend to be more progressive, right? Uh, they tend to be more liberally oriented, and um, they tend to be more calling for change and reform and so on. Not in this country. Uh, 
many uh, statistics show that the teens and 20 year olds, 20s, and they are the most conservative actually of all the, you know, F trade and in this country. So it's in a marked contrast with other countries. Uh, take an example, uh, Hong Kong or the UK or, you know, the US or, you know, in these countries, uh, younger people tend to be more progressive, pro-reform, but not in this country. Um, that's a great enigma. And that might actually be coupled with the general sense of stagnation in this country. But however, this feeling itself that, you know, uh, this country is not so much for uh, reforms and uh, probably we should stick to the status quo has been going on for many, many years anyway, without uh, referring to generation changes, uh, differences and generation gaps and so on. Now, uh, it's quite interesting, uh, you know, in a uh, mature democracy, you would often find that there is a 50-50 division among uh, the general public. Uh, for example, in the United States, uh, about 50% of people support the Democrats, and the other 50 supports the Republicans, and also their demographic and geographical uh, you know, biases and uh, asymmetries. The nation as a whole would be supporting, roughly speaking, 50% uh, are Republicans and 50% Democrats. The same, uh, I think, is true for U the UK. Although there have been some swing votes, generally speaking, uh, about 12, because there's this liberal Democrats and um, you know, UKIP and other parties. But generally speaking, half of half the population would support conservatives and half would support uh, the Labour Party. So I think the situation is quite similar in many other democracies, but not in Japan. You know, we do have pro-reform liberal uh, parties, but they tend to be regarded as somewhat fringe. The largest opposition party, uh, um, I don't know how they translate it, into English, uh, Riken Minsto, they, I think, have only 60%, sorry, 6%, not 60, 6% 6 of the pop general population supporting them. 6%? Can you believe that? There's no chance that they would win the next general election. So no matter what um, you know, types of political scandal might uh, erupt, and no matter how, Prime Minister Abe or Prime Minister Suga might be criticized. There is no realistic chance that the Liberal Democratic Party would be overthrown from the power. So this is really strange, isn't it? I mean, to say the least. Why is the Japanese politics so stagnant? And, you know, why uh, the Japanese uh, tend, you know, they are fond of thinking themselves that are belonging to the majority. I think this is the greatest enigma. But you know, interestingly, if you look back on history, it is true that the Japanese people would like to think that uh, they belong to the majority with only a fringe of people, a fringe minority uh, making noise and complaining about the status quo. But you know, the thing is, if you look back on history, sometimes that definition of much a majority would change and shift and then there would this uh, rapid shift like in the major restoration when the Edo government uh, run by the shogunate samurai warriors were overthrown by uh, the reforming powers um, our political system centered around the emperor was established and a rapid modernization of Japan began. In this process, uh, you know, there was this really swift uh, change of what are uh, considered a majority. 
But then, um, interestingly, when that flip flop occurs, uh, people can change their attitudes overnight. Similar thing happened when Japan uh, lost in the Second World War. When Japan surrendered, uh, General MacArthur came to Japan and they, he made orders from the GHQ headquarters and almost overnight, you know, before that, uh, the United States was considered to be the enemy and the Americans were considered to be some kind of demons. But overnight, uh, people praised General MacArthur and, you know, almost regarded him as the president. And this is really funny, but it's certainly true. So there you also see it happening. I mean, you know, when the, what is normal in society is redefined, people follow suit and they want to jump on, onto the bandwagon. And they would uh, prefer to say that uh, they are in majority. So, well, yeah, I'm in the Marnochera and there's a police bike going. Um, these are the illuminations of this season towards Christmas and towards the end of uh, the year. It's beautiful. Gives you a sense of celebration and festivity. But this year, of course, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, I think the celebration would be more, much more subdued uh, compared to uh, a typical year. Still, um, this part of the town is beautiful. Yeah, where was that? So yeah, so as I was saying, uh, when this shift in what is normal happens, then uh, all of a sudden, people change their attitude. So that is to say that in the post-World War era, um, starting in 1945, and after the establishment of the rule of LDP, Liberal Democratic Party, in 1955, the political system of Japan has been always stable, remarkably stable. And um, so, you know, this is really a different situation from other countries where, you know, there would be always this variety of political opinions and because there's this hung opinion, so to speak, where 50% of people support this idea and 50% of people support the other idea and there will be this heterogeneity in society. And so you would never know the, in which direction the swing boat would be uh, cast and there will be uh, government changes. And today's opposition is today's, uh, tomorrow's uh, ruling party and today's government is, would be tomorrow's opposition. Uh, this kind of normalcy in parliamentary democracy was, has not been observed in Japan. Uh, speaking of myself, <laughs> I always probably belonged to uh, belong to the mi minority opinion group at any given time. <laughs> so that's probably why I'm doing this, you know, um, making noise. And you know, uh, for example, I don't like Japanese comedy, right? I mean, Japanese TV show continually shows this for me um, nonsensical depiction of comedians rubbing each other's apples and, you know, polishing each other's apples, sorry, and, you know, uh, saying nice things about their private lives together. And senpai, kohai, senpai is uh, those people who are senior, more senior than you, and kohai is those people who are more junior to you. And, you know, the Japanese comedians, especially from the Yoshimoto uh, faction, they tend to emphasize the role of uh, senpai and kohai and you know all these for me rubbish on terrestrial tv so i really don't lo love to you know watch japanese tv i mean i don't have the time to begin with what with my research and what is my writing and whatever but you know 
it's, it is true that a majority of Japanese people do keep watching these things and they don't know anything else. You know, I have been making complaints and noises about the alternative possibilities, uh, political comedies like Veep. I have just finished watching Veep by Amando Inarchi uh, up to the sixth season. I think it's brilliant. Um, I have been, uh, you know, big fan of the Yes Minister franchise for many years. I love Forty Towers and you know uh, the Office. All this wonderful, uh, both the U.S. version and the U.K. version, but probably more U.K. version. Not so much the U.S. version, but although I think the U.S. version has its merits. Uh, Father Ted, IT Crowd. You know, I have been admiring these comedy shows, and and you know, I have been saying that probably Japan should produce something equivalent to that, but. Nobody listen. You know, I mean, people don't listen because they believe this. For me, in my uh, eyes, garbage uh, format of comedians just taking it easy and you know uh, doing nonsensical things on Japanese TV. Uh, the Japanese people tend to think that these are their cup of tea, which is not my cup of tea, and um, they do not have the sensitivity to. Imagine that there are people who have alternative values and because they believe that they belong to the majority and they believe that belonging to the majority is normal. So, you know, this there's this very interesting tangle between the really uh, stagnant politics and the lack of political, social, social comedy, satire, political satire in Japan. The NHK does not. NHK, the NHK does not categorically, does not broadcast political satire. It's a far cry from the BBC, of course, you know, the BBC broadcasts political satire all the time. Oh, here's a nice Christmas display. Uh, it's a peninsula hotel Tokyo. It's nice. Yeah, the Japanese people are really good at attending to these details of sensory experience. Um, I do admire that. Um, you know, that's what I love of this country. I love Japanese food. I love Japanese history. I love Yasujiro old films. I love, you know, Japanese nature. But I don't so much love uh, Japanese political culture, as I was saying. Um, there's no heterogeneity, there's no uh, feeling <coughs> or respect for the mi minority opinion. And so I sometimes feel, uh, almost feel as if I am an e uh, exile in this country, in my home country, politically, culturally speaking, comedy-wise. I love uh, traditional Japanese comedy, uh, Rakugo. On the manzai. But you know, so th th these are excellent, but at the same time, these are the not these are not the only comedy format. Um, I, I think uh, the ups and downs and the fiascos of the Abe administration and now the Suga government would provide a golden opportunity for comedians to make laughter. I do believe that. I do believe that there's this opportunity of window opportunity uh, to make great uh, satire political satire out of uh, the you know funny instance of tragedies and comedies of the Japanese political system but you know there's no market for that there's almost no market for that and because of the lack of this uh, comedy I think that in my opinion, the Japanese people are less politically mature compared to the counterparts in other countries. So I really think that Yoshimoto um, comedians are doing disservice to this country by their monopoly of 
the comedy scene by this, you know, imposing on the public of their really local uh, sensitivities because after all, it originally came from Osaka. And, you know, those comedians from Osaka, they pride themselves on, uh, you know, being the leading uh, voices in Japanese comedy. And I do uh, grant that, uh, that some Yoshimoto comedians are excellent. And uh, Yomoshimoto Shinkiki, that's uh, a particular theatrical comedy uh, performed by the Yoshimoto comedians uh, enjoyable but that's not the only you know comic format uh, there are many other opportunities so why do they you know do they assume that uh, they should dominate the pretty Japanese uh, comedy scene that's insane and what no wonder why uh, no wonder the, the Yoshimoto comedians are kind of uh, dancing a tango in with the LDP nowadays, the ruling party. In other countries, you know, in a typical democracy, the comedians would be always su be suspicious of the power that be. Uh, in the US, uh, the comedians make laughter out of the fiascos of Donald Trump. But when Joe Biden is sworn in after his, you know, after January 20th, uh, I'm sure the the American comedians would make laughter out of Joe Biden's and Kamala Harris's uh, doings. That's a job um, for the comedian. But uh, in this country, the comedians, I'm not going to name them by individuals, but because it's not really essential. Um, in this country, the comedians uh, act as if they belong to the ruling class. This false sense of being in the majority of society and you know being in the power position uh, is what's wrong with the Japanese comedy uh, because they you know they do not have a critical eye and their intelligence comic intelligence suffers. You know, there's not much intelligence in Japanese comedy now broadcast on Japanese terrestrial TV. Uh, this is not news. This is a common knowledge. And, you know, so I'm always making complaints about these things, but the change don't, things don't change. Uh, I'm happy. I'm okay. <laughs> I do my job and I have my friends and I have people who agree with me. But uh, uh, for the reasons I have been describing, it will be really difficult, if not impossible, to stage a coup in Japanese politics and in Japanese comedy. Because as I have, say, I have been saying, the Japanese people love to consider themselves uh, to be belonging to the majority and in a silent way. Uh, you know, uh, they don't actually, the, those people who believe that they belong to the majority, they do not uh, make noise about it. They do not be, go on assertive. They do not go on an early morning rant on their Twitter, like uh, Donald Trump. <laughs> they just remain silent and they just support the status quo uh, silently. Uh, for me, that is the most serious disease of this nation, if you like. I mean, you know, I have written a book on Ikigai, and I, in that I lauded some aspects of Japanese culture. I believe that there are some nice things about this nation. Of course, there are some nice things about any nation, but um, it is true that there are some very nice thing, things about this nation. But at the same time, uh, you know, bright sides are always accompanied by dark sides. And, you know, there are also some really not so good, you know, aspects of this nation. And the fact that people tend to believe that they belong to the majority 
in society is one of the diseases of this society. I know, um, you know, I know uh, people living abroad would probably see the beautiful side of Japan. You know, I know uh, these beautiful sides of Japan, like uh, cherry blossom, hanami, and uh, you know, traditional culture, manga, anime, and so on. And I do pride myself on these things, but at the same time, um, if you live in a country uh, long enough, um, like I have been doing, you do tend to start to see these problems, and by working on these problems, maybe you can make the society, make, make the nation better. Uh, I love American culture, but I know at the same time that there are some dark sides of American culture. I love UK English uh, culture. After I, uh, I was in the UK for two years doing my postdoc, but I at the same time know that there are some dark sides of um, the, I, I, the society in the UK. So we should always, you know, make these observations and compare notes and by this dialogue and trialogue and conversation and um, exchange of information on the network, uh, I think probably we can probably come to a better understanding of each other, a uh, better understanding of oneself, because after all, in the mirror system of the brain, uh, the self and others are reflected in a comparative study, so to speak, of you know, um, each other. And it is really interest, intellectually stimulating to, you know, contrast with each other uh, the unique individualities of ourselves. And uh, today I have been talking about the peculiar nature of Japanese politics and Japanese comedy uh, in that they are really stagnant and they do not have sensitivities to um, alternative uh, ways of doing things. By the way, I'm in the Hibiya Park now and um, today I am uh, on uh, the way to a uh, business meeting of uh, dinner, I think, and um, I'm going to meet David McDonald, Mr. David McDonald of Discovery Japan. Uh, he's a really interesting person, um, I hear, although this is the first time I'm going to meet David. Uh, David McDonald has been working on in such companies like Docomo and YouTube, and now he is the chief of the Discovery Japan, and he's, I understand, bringing about many wonderful reforms to this wonderful com company, digital transformation, and uh, this Discovery Japan is offering many interesting programs and, you know, um, and some localized contents too. And I actually do uh, have uh, my own program on design and arts, uh, where I am the master of ceremony MC of the program. It's called Creator and its Merry Fellows. I don't know how it's translated into English. I mean, this is a tentative title. Um, I invite people from all walks of life uh, in the creative industry in, here in this country, and I interview them. And um, it's such a fun program to make, and I hope it will be well received. Uh, so far, we have uh, released three episodes from season one, and so I don't know, uh, it'll be really fun to talk with David McDonald, uh, who, who I understand is originally from Canada, my favorite country, because uh, Canada is the first country that I visited as a uh, 15 year old to study English. Uh, bring back, brings back good memories, but anyway, I think I am approaching the venue of today's meeting, so I will probably stop here. Uh, well, before that, I would like to take you to a wonderful place in this park, uh, which is um, Hibiya Public Library. This is a very famous public library. And by the way, this is um, Hibiya Kokaido Hall. 
home to many historically important concerts, and I think it's under the process of renovation right now, Hibiya Kokaido. But this is a really important site historically in the cultural development of the nation. Uh, I understand they are having many important classical concerts and many excellent players performed there. That's the Hibiya Kokaido musical. And um, now I'm going to take you to the Hibiya Public Library. So, yes, um, this is a beautiful city. Tokyo is such a wonderful city to live in and work in. Uh, I really love working in Tokyo, despite what I have been saying. Uh, one always makes these uh, observations, and uh, you know that doesn't necessarily mean that one is fed up with uh, the place where one lives. Um, I love living in Tokyo, and uh, I'm convinced that there will be a lot of opportunities for this city yet, and for many people from abroad to visit here and live here and work here like David McDonald is doing. So I hope I'm going to put this on YouTube and I don't know how many people would gonna see this but you know this is just a small effort to make things better for Tokyo, for Japan and for all people who are interested in this tiny part of the world. This is the Hibiya Public Library. Um, I sometimes visit there because this is the library, but also it's an um, uh, art gallery too. And there is this uh, exhibition going on by Hiroshi Aramata, a really great friend of mine. And he's ex doing this exhibition on manga. Hiroshi Aramata is a great lover and connoisseur of the genre of manga, so uh, he is having a great exhibition there. So I'm really approaching my venue now, so I should say goodbye to you. I think this has been probably the longest <laughs> video that I've taken walking in Tokyo, and it has been fun. So see you around, and please take a great care of yourself and your loved ones in this time of uh, great uncertainty all over the world. From Tokyo, Kemogi speaking.